Before I introduce you to our first speaker, I would like to quickly inform you a bit about the format of the series. So over the next half year, we will have 10 papers in total, each of which will be around 35 minutes, followed by question and answers. And as it is our idea to really build up a sort of discussion forum, we encourage you to attend as many uh, seminars as possible. And we will um, post the registration links for the seminars about one week in advance, or in case you haven't done so, you are also invited to join our mailing list to receive the re registration links uh, directly. So you can send our administrator Candy an email. You can find that information on our website. And many thanks to Candy also for helping out with organizing all the technical issues for the series. And today's series will be recorded and possibly it will be made uh, available later. We will decide that later. So uh, are there any anything I have missed, Liana? Otherwise, I introduce uh, Columbo? Okay. So having said that, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker, Columba Gonzalez Duarte, who is currently an, an assistant professor at in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of uh, at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax. And Columba gained her PhD in sociocultural anthropology from the University in Toronto in 2019. And since then was postdoc fellow at the Department of Geography and Planning of the University of Toronto and at the Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity. And Columbus research interests are related to monarch butterfly conservation dynamics, exploring the connections between NAFTA's agri-food industry, labor migration and monarch decline. She has also worked with scientific and indigenous communi communities that cohabit with this butterfly across Canada, the United States and Mexico. And today she will also be speaking about this butterfly. So enjoy her talk, love or disgust, one butterfly, two worlds. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks for organizing this event. I'm very glad I'm thinking my work through these ideas of heroes and villains of the Anthropocene. Let me first situate you in my research and in in this work in progress that I'm gonna to present today. I, for my doctoral thesis, I followed this butterfly across North America. This butterfly migrates from what we know today as Canada, United States and Mexico because it's tuned, the whole life cycle is tuned with a weed. So the butterfly needs this weed, which is called milkweed to survive. They lay eggs on it, they eat from this weed. And when they don't have the weed, in the winter, as many other weeds, they die off. And um, it developed this complex migration to the south, to Mexico, where it hibernates there over winter. There um, a few trees, special trees that this butterfly likes. And now that area is an UNESCO protected area. So I'm highlighting in this talk, this idea, this contrast between the North and South. I'm, I'm trying to convey uh, colonial ethos behind that North and South, especially in the conservation policies of this corridor, but also the geographies through which this butterfly moves. So we have people in the North, which I call modern butterfly amateurs, that connect with this butterfly in a special way because they do have them as eggs, as caterpillars and adults, and then as a butterfly that will make, migrate in the fall. But in the South, people only have contact with these butterflies in hibernation. So they don't have eggs, no caterpillars, um, they just see them living. So they really have these different uh, affective relationships with the butterfly depending in the moment of the life cycle. So I'm making a cross trend between this butterfly amateur, um, the people in the South, which I call here tree loggers. Obviously they are more complex character, but for the purposes of the talk, I'm, I'm framing in, in that character. In terms of the theory, and this is a work in progress, as I say, I'm trying to bring two bodies of literature. One of them is the idea of the ontological turn, the idea that we don't have different worldviews, we have different worlds. And, and, I'm in, and that's the reason of the talk, one butterfly, two worlds. And I want to engage with this theory from a decolonial perspective. And 
to do that, I'm also bringing affect theory. I'm trying to the, uh, explore the affective relationships between the butterfly amateurs in the north and the um, inhabitants of the reserve in the south. And the talk, the way I organized it, I first have uh, an introduction of, of my question of why insects and how we can learn something from insects um, and how they appear also in our cultural texts in general. And after that, I'll pass to the discussion of these butterfly amateurs, uh, three loggers and heroes and villains. So insects, they easily live from invisibility to enormity. Um, and that's what also prompts ideas of fascination with the insect or repulsion. And this is because insects are of open access. We can find them everywhere. We can find them in the house. We can find them in the kitchen, the lab, the yard, um, in the wild, of course, they eat us. Uh, so that open access of insects generates that idea of fascination or repulsion, repulsion, the pest of the marvel insect. And with monarchs, uh, we usually have this figure of the marvel insect, but they are still, as uh, Jay Cossack says, the animal, the, the non-animal of the animal or the other of the other. And I contend that that's related with that open access of, of, of insects in general, but all butterflies too. And I'll be speaking to that in this, this talk. Another th uh, thing that we see with insects is that they have this in-between state because they go through a transformation and metamorphosis. We often see them in texts or cultural texts calling out uh, for the in-between stage, which could be seen we could fear them, and we have those, all these movies which enlarge insects as ants, uh, or these movies that talk about that in between stand, part insect, part human. The pest, of course, is very recurrent uh, around those texts. And we also see, and this is connected with butterflies as well, they not only some these metaphors of the positive, of the afterlife, of fragility and strength, but also that in between is in which for some cultures, depending on the culture, we may see a connection with an idea of what is deviant. Um, in the case of butterflies, we see this related with the object of obsession. You may recognize that movie, The Silence of the Lambs of 1991, or this other um, landmark and controversial text, Lolita 1955, written by uh, Vladimir Nabokov, in which he uses actually the symbols of butterflies to talk about that object of obsession. In general, we, although we see uh, how insects are used here to tell a story, there's also a contrast of insects not having something to say. And this contrast comes from the world of science and the world of, of humanities and different texts that use them as some, as, as insects have, and the idea that insects have something to say. So in the world of science, um, this is related with the, fa with the assumption that insects do not, they are not sensitive to pain because they don't have a central nervous system. Um, they're not sensitive to pain. They don't have a story to tell. That's the reason we have, for example, vivisection, uh, uh, doing research with uh, insects when they are alive. And that's the reason we don't need ethics to work with insects, at least in the United States. Everyone can work with an insect in a lab and everyone can have an insect in at home. Um, that's the reason I wanna call attention to this idea of open access. In contrast of that childless story, we also have big productions around the idea of insects being tiny, but having a big story to tell. And monarchs are part of this. The migration pattern has been spectacularized in different movies and books. And that's what called my attention to the conservation of this butterfly. Insects are a particular spatial companion animal for investigating human perceptions of nature and human nature. Their group behavior, quick but discrete reproduction and metamorphic abilities associated with their ability to buck humans often reveal otherness related anxieties. 
in this talk. I am presenting a work in progress which explores one charismatic insect, monarch butterflies, and its relationship to different groups of humans. Especially, I explore relationships between monarchs and amateurs monarchs protectors in the northern geographies of the Monarch Conservation Corridor, and between monarchs and forest inhabitants in the south, especially in Mexico. I juxtapose these characteristics and the affective relationships between them to discuss why they reveal our environmental politics in the so-called age of the Anthropocene. I argue for a need to move beyond simplistic tropes that cast monarch protectors as heroes and tree loggers as villains towards thinking to the incommensurability of different life worlds this actor inhabit, even as both groups wish for the monarch to live and thrive. By traveling with the monarch, and traces its effective ties with the cast of actors, we can, I hope, begin to think about ways of living better with humans and more than human difference in the face of planetary emergency. So when I speak of love and disgust and one butterfly, two world, the title of this talk, I do so in two interrelated senses. On one hand, love or disgust conveys the capacity that monarch butterflies have over humans, a capacity to affect and be affected. In my field work, I observe and ask about the impulse behind different butterfly human encounters. Is it repulsion or attraction or is it both? or does it escape description in human terms? On the other hand, love and disgust are felt by humans toward other humans when they relate to this butterfly in contrasting ways. How can we understand such impulse through an anti-capitalist and anti oppression lens? And how do the answer to these questions help us arrive to a more complex view of the worlds implicated in the Anthropocene? A starting point for my intervention is the idea of affect. I explore how the butterfly's affect generates love or repulsion among the different humans cohabiting with this insect. The term affect is not merely synonymous with emotions, also it includes them, but also captures their intensities between the two or more bodies in an encounter. For butterfly amateurs encountering the monarch in the backyards of the houses, love is the main impulse that moves them to rear and later protect monarchs. For the reserve residents in Mexico, a character who I label the tree logger, although they are clearly more than that, love is not a word associated with the monarch. Monarchs are liked and appreciated, like any other forest inhabitant, but they also provoke disgust. This ambivalence stems from the top-down creation of the forest reserve designed to protect the butterfly. With the foundation of the reserve, monarchs were no longer just one more forest resident and became seen as a curse by some community members whose livelihoods were interrupted by the reserve. Feelings of love or disgust are also shared between the human actors cohabiting with the monarch. So here I made these slides in, to frame it in the heroes and villains. I'm not going to speak of all of them in the talk, but um, I'm going to be speaking of the butterfly amateurs, that lady in pink that has that plant. That plant is the seed of the wheat, the milk wheat that the butterfly needs. And because she rears monarchs, she also needs to cultivate the milk wheat. So she was showing me those seeds that, um, that will be the plants next summer. We also have um, a, in the top part in black and white, the scientists, the image that you have there is actually the scientist who discovered the migration route. And he did that by tagging the monarch wings for decades. Underneath that image, you have an uh, image of another prominent scientist, an American scientist, the one that has the butterfly in his mouth. and I picked an image of him because he's a prominent connector with the butterfly amateur world and the butterfly scientist world. Um, we also have an image of Roundup. I'm not going to be talking a lot about it, but Roundup is the Monsanto herbicide that kills milkweed. So you don't have milkweed, you don't have butterflies. So it's a big villain of this conservation corridor. We have the tree logger, um, who is that inhabitant of the reserve that now lives in an UNESCO area, has lost access to traditional forms of agriculture and livelihoods in general. 
And we also have the avocado toast. I'm not going to be talking a lot about that, but I, I want to call attention to this demand of avocado in the north, which is having an impact in the monarch butterfly forest in the south. And of course, we have the, the butterfly and there as the big hero of the story. Amateurs are disgusted by villagers when they cut trees and villagers are disgusted by the amateurs excessive care and investment in this insect survival. These different ideas of how a monarch should live creates antagonism, heroes and villains, all characters in the same plot trying to live together. Also, they have these time geographies. I see each of these actors' ecologies as co-produced. They are brought together by the monarch's migratory journey and they share the traveled effort to let the butterfly live. While the real real protagonists of this story defy these easy tropes, this dichotomy of hero and villain and the feeling evoked by it, too often in farm conservation efforts, effective in turn, the livelihoods of those who cohabitate with monarchs. Monarch butterfly conservation occurs in grounded ecologies and in cyberspace space, where affective ties with the butterfly are forged globally. The internet has spectacularized the monarch migration troubles in novel ways, reinforcing the hero and villain narrative. We have, of course, a general trope of these butterflies as heroic, completing an impossible force in a migratory loop to places they don't know. And to do so, they expand their life cycle to survive winter in Mexico. In fact, some scholars say that Danaos, its scientific name, comes from the reference to the Danites of Greek mythology, 50 women condemned for eternity to complete an impossible task. So image that you have there of the Danites, um, they're trying to complete this impossible task of filling that vessel. And then you have in the middle a map, and I just wanna highlight here how that migration is seen as impossible. If you consider that they don't know, that monarchs do not know this route, uh, the migratory route, um, they have not traveled to that place before with their uh, parents or grandparents. And if you consider that they expand the life cycle to do this. So um, in human terms, this will be equal of having grandchildren that are able to live 450 years to perform a migration when they don't have food or where it's too cold from winter. Um, this butterfly, the same individual will live up to nine months to perform the migration. And that's the reason I wanna call attention to how uh, monarch butterfly amateurs in the North could be in contact with exactly the same individual that someone in the South will be in contact. And then on the, on the left, you have an image of this spectacularization of when all the butterflies of the East Coast of North America gather, in, especially in those trees. The butterfly here, like the knights, is cast as heroic, magnificent, in charge of the impossible, the migration, and at risk. In the same line of heroism, we have the monarch discoverer, the scientist. One male scientist in particular became famous for tracking the insects migratory route after decades of tagging monarch wings. The celebration of the discoverer as hero continues a long standing colonial ethos, which sees Western knowledge as superior knowledge, the righteous path toward protecting this butterfly. I won't speak much about this today, but this heroification of Western science vis a vis other ways of knowing justifies Northern interventions in the South, often with deadly outcomes. In the same heroic spectrum, there is a tender character, the butterfly amateur who seeks to help the monarch and the scientist through almost obsessive relation with this butterfly. This in turn often villainizes those who kill the butterfly from Monsanto in the Northern Prairies, whose service I round up allegedly kills milkweed in which monarchs lay their eggs, to tree loggers in the reserves who threaten the butterfly's hover winter habitat. Finally, we have the ambiguous figure of the reserve inhabitant, a villain if they cut down trees, but a hero if they protect them. Yet it is not just the reserve inhabitant that challenges this hero-villain binary. Engaging with this troubled figure invites us to reflect back on the full cast of characters to see how they are simultaneously both heroes and villains. This is what I have also proposed the idea of love and disgust. While these actors share different affective relationships with the butterfly, they also share different affective relations with each other. 
marked by love or disgust or both. These in turn shape the politics and direction of the conservation corridor. Let me just add myself to this plot. I also struggle to escape this villain hero trope in my own scholarly intervention. If I critique the reserves top-down model, I may be cast as a pro-people anthropocentric scholar who cares little about the trees and insects. If I emphasize the value that this butterfly has in my life and how it has affected and transformed my scholarship, I am a villain for not accounting for those humans suffering in the reserve. In this way, I think the call for papers, writing this is probably saving me months of therapy. <laughs> in all seriousness though, if we can't escape the cyber spectacularization of heroes and villains, we might as well inhabit it to see what it can offer. What can we make of these oppositions and how can they help us to rethink environmental politics in the Anthropocene? To explore these questions, I want to travel further with two of the central characters in the monarch story, who are often juxtaposed, the butterfly amateur, the citizen scientist, and the tree logger. I want to explore how the dichotomy between them is perpetuated in conservation discourse and practice, and how these actors and the relations between them and between them and the butterfly matter for the way the conservation corridor works. More importantly, I suggest that this spectacularization opposition of a horrid amateurs and villain loggers may often an interesting path for exploring the many worlds, one world intention. One butterfly, yet two worlds. One butterfly, yet radically different ideas about how or why it should live. Inhabiting those oppositions, this world's intention, at least for a moment, may hold important lessons for living with difference in a way that promotes less suffering and more flourishing both for humans and no humans. The first step of this journey took us to Minnesota, where I began my ethnographic work among monarch butterfly amateurs in the United States and Canada. I first met the butterfly amateur in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. It was a conference in St. Paul to convert North Americans interested in monarch butterfly conservation. They gathered for three days to exchange knowledge and experiences about the insect. I went to the Congress as an attendee. It was my first field in contact with the monarch world. Part of the event included doing field trips. These are a common practice among entomologists in which they collectively look for insects, crossing them off of a checklist, in this case, prairie habitat. The more checked boxes of the list, the more expertise. When the work is over, people compare their list and informally prize the participant who managed to see the most quailed insects. On this trip, my assignment group was looking for monarch butterflies in the egg, caterpillar, and adult stage. Armed with a conference issue field guide and a water bottle, we set out to explore Minnesota's arboretum together. I remember this talk as unpleasant. I had a hard time understanding the interest in searching for insect eggs underneath each meal with leaf. They are tiny, about a millimeter long, and hard to find because this butterfly is in sharp decline. It was hot and humid, and I struggled to find an egg or a conversation topic. Suddenly, a participant's sneakers caught my eye. They were basketball shoes hand painted with monarch butterflies and other artistic motifs. It was the perfect conversation starter. I like your sneakers, I commented. Thank you, she replied. A friend in Toronto gave them to me. What a coincidence, I answered. I also live in Toronto. We agreed that we should meet again in Canada. Meanwhile, she told me to check out her Facebook profile, the Monarch Butterfly Crusader. During that week, I met many more butterfly amateurs, some of whom call themselves crusaders. From now on, on I will use both terms to present these so-called heroes of monarch conservation. The following summer, I met up with the sneaker-clad crusader again. We scheduled an appointment at her house in Toronto, Canada. As on many other occasions with butterfly amateurs, our chat took place in the garden. We sat on a small bench that looked out over her recently rewilded yard. I have been raising butterflies for years, she told me. It all started when I met my former husband 30 years ago. He invited me to join a butterfly hunt and I fell in love with him and with this little insect. Yet it wasn't until we became a parrot and came out as a closet as, and came out as a closet as a gay woman that monarchs took on another meaning in my life. I be, it became a way of integrating into my new community. 
the butterfly crusader brings me her latest published book on monarchs and she continues. For some years, I took photos of our events on a voluntary basis. I wanted to return something to those who paved the way for me to be out. With time, I began to bring my race monarchs to our events. I placed them with people. Sometimes they took the butterflies home. Butterflies, butterflies have that therapeutic gift. They experience a metamorphosis. They emerge and are there for us to witness life. That's when an inspiration came to me. That is when I found my name, the Monarch Butterfly Crusader. These crusader stories inspired me to reflect on affect for the first time. How was this butterfly a companion to the crusader to the point of co-producing her identity? How are her volunteer practices across the LGBT community affected by her monarch companions? Are monarchs mobilizing affects, helping to reimagine kin and human identities? And how is her garden transformation from the flat grass to a wild prairie, inviting more insects guests into the butterflies crusaders intimate space. It's speaking to engagements with the Anthropocene. Who exerts powers in this capacity to mobilize monarchs for human desires? This last question is a topic that I have encountered more than once among my amateur interlocutors. They acknowledge being affected by the monarch butterflies with whom they work and which they bring them joy through their hobbies, but they also recognize that there is a relationship of power over their companions. Some of my interlocutors who raise butterflies for collecting are uncomfortable with that power, particularly not setting them free but they seem to take pleasure in the malleability and ability to handle the insect for a while, and most of them let them go. So the images that you have here show you uh, someone that rears monarchs. Um, you have those baskets and handing them, you will see in, in some of them green chrysalises. That means that the chrysalis is still in transformation. When you see black chrysalis, that means that it's about to emerge, which is called eclosion. And the images that you have to your right show you a butterfly that already eclosed. They are fresh, that's how they call it. And when they are fresh, they don't move um, that much. That's the reason that people try to control that part of the life cycle by controlling temperature and natural light. And they can delay the eclosure or they can accelerate the eclosure. There's a clear intervention in the life cycle that speaks to that malleability and open access that I talked before. Some monarch amateurs who are more drawn to science also attack monarch wings, which provides information to scientists and release them in migration season so they can join wild monarchs on the journey towards the OML forest in Mexico. Those tag monarchs are sometimes recovered and they provide information on the departure site and date. What does this power relationship tell us if we explore it through the affective lens of that ability to affect and be affected? My very preliminary observations is that the affecting angle helps us to think through the politics of multiple worlds. It helps us reveal how this one butterfly moves across and co-constitutes two or more worlds. In the world of the amateurs, embodied aesthetic and intimate encounter inspire love for monarchs, which motivates their conservation work. It cultivates in the crusaders an almost obsessing compulsion to stay in that affective zone. Yet also motivates them to extend their agency into conservation policies in other spaces and scales along the migratory route. These activities can confirm the self-perception as heroes or crusaders, but can problematically reinforce an us versus them narrative in relation to those who they see as harming the butterfly. As the butterfly crusader shares, once you experience the birth of a monarch, once you hold that little life, you are hooked. You have to go for another hunt. When I asked her about how she became a crusader, she narrates, I read every published book on monarchs. I became an expert. When monarch amateurs use the word expert, it indicates a change from the amateur status to a higher status in the fight for monarch conservation. They are no longer mere butterfly chasers or enthusiasts. They are experts contributed to conservation science. They enter the spectacle of monarch conservation from that in-between role. The Toronto-based crusader remarks, I am a citizen scientist, but crusader defines me better, she continues. I recognize the charge of religious and negative connotation, but I still use it because I want to save this insect. I want people to know, love, and protect monarchs. And the image that we have that there is not necessarily from this crusader. I'm just using the representation of uh, butterfly amateurs for monarchs. 
Butterfly amateurs are often explicit in recognizing that their entry into the world of conserving monarchs is motivated by love. However, this love can easily turn to disgust towards those who treat the monarchs. If it's Monsanto, they call the devil because their harvest and roundup kills a weed essential for monarch survival. If it's those who kill the trees that monarchs need, they are poor loggers, supposedly ignorant of the magnificence of this butterfly. Amateurs are also prominent social media users where this us versus them narrative circulates and is reproduced. Indeed, also there is a still more research needed to understand the effects of Roundup and other herbicides and pesticides on monarch population. Amateurs successfully pressure the company to donate money to protect monarchs through online activism. It is also not uncommon for them to channel funds to monarch protection in Mexico, either through direct don donations to Ranger programs or the larger WWH managed conservation initiative that emerged and operates without the full support of local communities. Let me move on now to what is often deemed to be the opposite of love, disgust. To do so, let me take you to the Oyamel Forest in Michoacan and Estado de Mexico, Mexico, where we encounter an alleged villain or perhaps another hero of the monarch story. And here I'm, I'm crafting a story uh, based on my field work that narrates how people in this reserve have connected with um, the butterfly, but also with the UNESCO conservation model. Mountain man, deer man, water man. His parents spoke Mazagua, Ñato indigenous language, and fled to Mexico colonial plantation or hacienda forced labor system by living in the upper mountain, hunting and harvesting corn. That was how they made a living. Corn is no longer enough to feed a family, so he works downhill in the lucrative piper industry that processes street pulp, pulp from the forest he grew up in. This temporary employment in the sawmills and Sritagora Michoacan involves cutting the trees. So he now loves the trees that saw him growing up. Walking back home, he sees a trailer, a big truck full of the trees. The monsters are unpaved, the dead roads are narrow and muddy. The trailer manages to pull itself out of the potholes. It's heavy, full of oil trees, dead trees. On the back, a sign. La Comercial, dead clean wood from the monte, the mountain. How did we get here, he wonders. Why am I occasionally a logger? And why are those trees, trucks full of my trees? It is March, the weather is warmer and the butterflies depart their winter home. They leave them when the corn harvest cycle starts. Animals and plants move in cycles, adjusted to the humidity, the sun, heat and cold. The monarch are living, the seeds are planted, these butterflies depart, a damage at home. Their winter house is being chopped down, their mountains ravaged by those chainsaws and trailers, killing wood and indirectly killing butterflies. La Comercial. This is what they call that company. It is a foreign corporation who partnered with a Mexican company. They load trains with dead trees, they ship them to Mexico City and beyond. This land is ours and the deers and the butterflies, but now we rent it to La Comercial. Once threatened to cut down our trees and give us back the dead land. Sometimes we cultivate this dead land. Some people from the city suggested we plant a fruit that grows well elsewhere, avocado. Sometimes I just cried. This is how we started to chop down our forest. That's how I became a tree logger. Things changed when they told us that the monarch came from the United States. For us, this butterfly is part of the forest. The insect's presence announces the arrival of our ancestors of the Day of the Dead. But we don't call it monarca, which is a Spanish word for monarch. We call it paloma. Paloma is a bird, a dove, or a pigeon. So this classification is common to other flying animals. Some call it cosechadora, which means harvester in English, because it arrives when it's time to harvest corn. It is orange like the flowers you use for day of the day rituals. We used to eat palomas about in about harvest year. Yet we keep them up there in the forest. They are part of it. When I was a kid, I occasionally played with them. They were part of this forest like the deer and many others. When they came, and often in the reserve when I worked there and they use this word came, um, they refer to conservationists or government workers. We learned that the Palomas travel from the same place where my uncle now lives, the United States. We already knew that they left, their, left, left here to reproduce elsewhere because we never saw eggs or caterpillars here. Now my land is protected. 
It is not clear from whom and why. Cutting down trees is illegal. Climbing up the mountain is illegal. But how is this possible? I am a man of water. I am a man of this mountain. This is my land and the deers. The bad guys, the narcos, sometimes hang out in the high mountains. Sometimes we see foreign men in the forest. Although it is forbidden, they also cut down our trees. Although it is prohibited, they pollute our waters with toxins to produce drugs. Although it is forbidden, they also grow avocado. The butterfly has no home. I don't have a house either. Our land is protected, but somehow I love it now. I am disgusted with myself. Others are too. They call us name. They blame us for this catastrophe. They say we are all becoming narcos and loggers. Yet I am from this land, that of the deer and that of the butterflies. Some days I hate this butterfly. Disgust. Who likes a tree logger? Clearly few people in the world of conservation, often not even the loggers themselves. After my visit to this reserve, I have learned that for many of the men and women who live in the modern butterfly biosphere reserve, unregulated tree chopping is a necessity. It is the last resort when other alternatives to make a living are gone. Yet these trees have a particular value in the world of conservation. They host a charismatic insect. They are the only possible home of our wintering monarchs. They are protected through an exchange value system instituted by the reserve that grants cash to communities in exchange of protecting live trees called payments of ecosystem services. Nonetheless, almost everyone I know in this reserve has been a tree logger at some point. And I want to say here that I use this category of the tree logger um, because it that's how it works in the world of conservation, but it doesn't work for them. They don't use these words. They will say that they are caring for the forest, maybe cutting some branches or cutting full bad, sick trees. It will be easy to cast them as villains, but they are caught up in a conservation model that has replaced their long-standing agricultural livelihoods with pre precarious solutions. Now they must also fight organized crimes incursions into these forests. Organized crime has recently proliferated in the region, driven by the expansion of both the lucrative drug industry and the supposedly illicit avocado industry. When the reserve first was created, banning traditional forest uses, the local locked the trees intentionally, trying to push the monarch out of the forest. Yet monarchs decided to return as they do each year, recognizing the futility of resisting the monarch program and the insect drive, inhabitants negotiated with the reserve and succeeded in obtaining permission to carry out some livelihood activities in the reserve as greenhouses, agriculture, or ecotourism. When these activities or temporary downhill employment are not enough, people may participate in logger or may enter in organized networks by force. However, they want a living tree and a healthy butterfly part of their forest as much as amateurs and conservationists do. So what does this tell us about the politics of this conservation program? And what does it suggest about the politics of the Anthropocene more broadly? Local visions of monarchs as part of the forest offers a clue and help explain what I mean when I say that this conservation conflict is an encounter between two worlds. For residents, palomas, monarchs are not more significant than other forest beings. And saying they are part of the forest indexes more than their simple presence. In some of these towns, this forest is a ritualized land. Inhabitants perform rituals to the land and forest for good water and good harvest. Living and non-living and human and more than human entities all protect the forest. Humans must offer protection to these entities through ritual practices. So the beings can in turn protect the forest. Disregarding the reciprocal duties required for this protection can bring misfortune. The forest is a communal property that is sacred provided of water, timber, and non-timber plant sources, animals to hunt, monarchs to eat, and mushrooms to forage. If a reserve inhabitant sees a monarch as a carrier of the soul of their ancestors during the date of the dead celebration, and they see it as a species tuned with the hybrid cycle and part of the ritualized forest and human ecology, this doesn't mean they don't also see the forest and the butterfly in utilitarian terms. The butterfly is also seen as an insect that helps them to make a living, mainly through tourism and souvenirs. In fact, before being protected, they could eat the butterfly if it was a short half per year, likely as part of that reciprocal relationship with the forest. When the reserve inhabitants claim they are water people, people of the mountain, just as the deer or the butterfly, they are referring to this world. 
a world where monarchs like them belong. Yet this view of belonging is drastically different than the conservation ethic motivating the amateur. One butterfly, two worlds. For four months, November to February, the reserve inhabitants live with the same butterflies. I mean, literally the same individual butterflies that a crusader bred and tagged in the Twin Cities in the early fall. Yet the three lager and the crusader inhabit two worlds. An amateur informed by Western science sees monarchs first as part of an invertebrate category, which allows them to conduct research or having them as pets at home because they are not protector. The amateur secondly sees the monarchs as needing protection because of the uniqueness of the migratory phenomenon. This hierarchical understanding of species is one that doesn't exist in the reserve. It contrasts with the reserve inhabitants beliefs and practices that they treat water, wood, deer, and monarchs as being who are simply part of the force. This ritualized ecology is often incommensurable with the scientific world and its ideas of why humans should protect these things and this forest. The reserve articulation across this axis occasionally cutting trees or eating butterflies. And let me clarify, they don't um, eat butterflies anymore. Um, still, um, and still wanting Palomas alive, underpins this villains and hero story that has been shaping this reserve and this international conservation corridor. For many of us, it will be intuitive to really fire a tree cutter and celebrate the work of the butterfly crusader against Monsanto, who often also donates money to protect this forest. Yes, it is my hope that this brief story has shown that both the crusaders and the tree choppers also maintaining radically different affective relations with the same butterfly want this organism alive. With common objectives, they inhabit radically different worlds that inform and are shaped by the engagement with this butterfly. They are economically, socially, and politically divided by a North and South disparity. And they have fundamentally different ideas of how or why this butterfly should live casting one as hero and the other as villain simplifies it, but it also makes it difficult to find a common cause. So how does this, this story inform environmental politics for the Anthropocene? And I'm concluding here. And how do we make sense of these two worlds converging around the same insect? I think one route is to acknowledge that, that we have indeed many worlds and in commerce reality exists. Yes, you have one planet in degradation. Monarch reveals that connection. Swim or sink together, literally. I'm quoting Savransky here. It is the complexity of the story of one butterfly yet two worlds, or even more worlds that the possibility for life for these insects and these humans companions exists. It is in the tensions between heroes and villains, affects and the cruel reality of extinctions where we may find a way to coexist. A world where many worlds fit, say the Zapatistas, world that may fix together this one world in trouble. In this way, this story illustrates and invites us to recognize the power of insects, not only as pollinators or malleable pets, but actors, actors actively forcing us to connect worlds by inviting us to recognize this tension between incommensurable worlds and interdependent fates, the monarch can, I hope, move us beyond a narrative which celebrates heroes and condemns villains to one that perhaps helps us learn to live better with difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Columba. That was really, really fascinating. And uh, we have now uh, around 10 minutes. Maybe we have a bit more, depending on how people want to stay or not want to stay or not uh, to, to receive questions. Um, so please go ahead. Just to say um, that I'm monitoring the chat box if anybody wants to type questions or just use the raise hand function. Thank you. Jan, Jan, you raised your hand, please. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, it was inspiring. Um, I have uh, two comments slash questions. One is about combining the ontological term turn with a decolonial perspective. I don't know if you know Todd's work on um, an indigenous feminist's take on the ontological term, like ontology as just another word for colonialism. So maybe you want to comment on that first? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I had I cut that part of the paper because it was still really long. Um, and I actually started this paper writing about that. I, I, I think actually when when I've been thinking around the ontological turn, the only text that made me uh, connect with it, it was actually Zoe Todd text in the sense that if we want to talk about, if we want to take in anthropology that many world lens to, uh, as a form of decolonization of thought, as Vivero de Castro says, the only way to do it is recognizing for those colonial relations in our sites of studies and those colonial forms in which we produce knowledge. So I'm trying to do this in this talk of recognizing that North-South colonial relationships and also that we may be able to produce knowledge in less colonial ways but connecting with this butterfly and acknowledging those two worlds in conversation. But thanks for that question, definitely inspires my work. Well, yeah, that's a perfect answer. <laughs> and um, following on that, you use ritualized ecologies. Um, I've heard more about spiritual ecology or sacred ecology. Is there a particular reason you're using spiritualized? Yeah, I mean, I'm still debating if that's the last term, but it's the one that makes more sense to me so far because the, the rituals that are performed in these uh, geosymbolic points, that's how uh, other scholars have called them inside the reserve, they are part Catholic and part indigenous. So they have this component of um, clear religion, but I'm hesitant to frame it only as a Catholic tradition. So I just stay with the part of the ritual. And because these rituals are also related with the harvest and with Day of the Dead, which is not Catholic, it has a pre-colonial tradition, I think the, the word rituals allows me to bring all those um, different uh, ideas on religion versus practices and traditions without having to discuss it. But maybe at some point I will have to discuss uh, religion here. And, but rituals for now works. Thanks. Uh, we have a comment from Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, um, who says that was a wonderful talk. Um, I've sometimes raised butterflies, moths from caterpillars, and I know it's quite common for these to be hosts to parasitic insects, example, wasps. These take over and eventually kill the caterpillar. And sometimes these are specialized on a particular host species. So if the host is declining, the parasite probably is too. And Andrew's wondering if um, this is something that the butterfly enthusiasts that you've spoken to um, have also dealt with caterpillars or raised caterpillars that are host to, parasite and to parasites and how do they respond to these? Are they objects of disgust or love? Good question. Um, they definitely find that parasite and often when it comes to the first time they don't know what it is and they just see them dead and then they, they probably will find more information around. Scientists have been trying to provide an information that they can transfer that parasite if they don't, are not handled in the right conditions. If you saw that image that I pick, that's someone that is being careful because they try to keep them in different baskets in this way or different, um, those sort of nests that they have to keep them enclosed. That's the right way to do it. Of course, there's no guide on these and because they are not regulated. Actually, if someone can just start rearing monarchs and go ahead until they start facing that they have this parasite. And if they release, the wild monarch with the parasite, um, then the captive monarch with the parasite that can pass it to the wild, which has been um, um, a worry for the scientists. But let me say that the scientists, they also have that problem at the lab because they also cultivate monarchs for doing research with them. So I, I don't want to create this opposition on amateurs not knowing or having this problem because scientists, they have the problem as well. And that at the end is a problem of having captive monarchs that are not able to free and migrate when it's migration season. Thanks for that question. Um, Andrew Johnson, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I apologize if the question is a bit scatterbrained. I, I've just realized I've got my COVID shot yesterday and, and a, a heavy bank of brain fog has, has started to move in. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I it was really, thank you so much for this talk. It was really uh, fascinating. and. And I also love how you break apart the heroes and villains category too. That was also something that sort of, that stuck with me. And I, I kind of want to I, I want to see what you would have to say to the figure of the butterfly as a kind of a cipher in in the middle of this. So the butterfly itself, the kind of the things which are not captured by the different human worlds. I wonder about the projection of kind of of relationships onto the butterfly. So for the amateur 
you know, for the butterfly uh, in, enthusiasts, the, for the experts and the North American experts, the butterfly becomes a way of talking about themselves. They, okay, so this, this transformation means something to me as well. Then also in Mexico for the loggers too, the butterfly becomes incorporated into their own, you know, a, an ancestors and, and, and their own world too. In those ways, those are both appropriating the butterfly into a human world, but the butterfly world remains a kind of a, kind of a cipher. And um, I wonder if there's any, if there's any uh, way to think about that um, malleability of the symbol or the, the, the sure world of many worlds, but um, there's also many worlds that are not captured or many worlds that are projected upon uh, others. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks for that. I mean, um, difficult to have an answer to that. I, um, definitely, because this species in particular is so malleable, it, it requires sort of more observation to see in which ways in it is not malleable. Because what you get at the first glance in this monarch world is that it's malleable for scientists, for amateurs, and in a way also for uh, in the forest, because they don't oppose, you know, almost anything like they may fly away is the the most resistance that they can do uh when they are not comfortable in the situation but it's very easy to keep them uh, captive and not letting them fly so uh i pay attention in in the ways that they perform the migration in like the form is, is so clear a material how they are tuned with their plants and the weather how they perform it every year and how by doing that in a way all the humans of this corridor are always uh, facing that that malleability is not uh, exhaustive, that they, at the end, the butterfly resists and it has its own form of living and they do adapt to that home, uh, humans often in the corridor, uh, all of them. So I pay attention to that form in which the butterfly actually forces them to adapt in what it has its own ethos, its own rationality, its own, own form of being there. Um, and the way I have found, and I'm not sure if this responds fully to your answer, but at least for me in the interspecies lens, I am I'm trying to do a more than human epistemology, thinking in the way it lives as a caterpillar, as an egg, and then as an adult butterfly and a migrating butterfly. And I arrange my material speaking from that. And that helps me in a way to reposition the butterfly as these. Uh, organism that is arranging life. Uh, it's arranging life in social and more than human terms. Thanks for that question. Um, Andrew, did you have another question because you still raising your hand or is that from previously? <laughs> <laughs> that COVID fog. <laughs> um, could I sort of slip in with a quick follow up question as well there because um, I thought, you know, I just, just to kind of um, pick up on, on some stuff that Andrew mentioned, um, I thought it was a brilliant paper, by the way, really, really interesting. Um, but but I thought it was really interesting how you showed how this, this one organism is kind of mediating between different worlds, as you put it. And I was wondering about if you could maybe unpack a little bit um, the way in which it was mediating between different temporalities as well. Um, you know, it was I found it really interesting how the butterfly serves as a cipher, for example, as Andrew says, for individual biographical life histories, like the metamorphosis of, of this woman who was married in a heterosexual relationship and then suddenly changed, um, or, you know, sort of between invocations of ancestors and a more kind of cosmological cycle. Or in the case of um, these crusaders, they've got this kind of ticking time bomb, right? This issue of extinction, the imminent extinction um, as this very close horizon that they're trying desperately to pull the butterfly back from. So I was just curious as to, you know, whether people actually speak in explicitly temporal terms when they discuss um, this butterfly and how we might maybe uh, make a little bit more um, in terms of conceptualizing the temporal stakes um, in, this, in this, uh, this relationship between worlds. This is such a good question. Um, I mean, this, we can take this uh, through the deep time, that, that deep time that has forged this migration, that deep time that connected um, these different habitats and through thousands and thousands of years. So I do try to put attention to that non-human time that is present there. And in, 
marvelous ways. They were like, we have this wheat which has populated the northern landscape through thousands of years because it's a tropical wheat. But um, eventually it started populating the northern landscapes, eventually that from that migration. And, and we also have a sort of a, the own time of the forest, which has also changed, right? This forest has changed in the Oyamel being in the upper mountains, that was not always the case. So I try to foreground that time of the non-human. Um, again, we did this effort of telling the story from the view of how this butterfly lives in this corridor. So there's that part of the temporality of the deep temporality, which matters. There's another part of temporality, which is time-space compression. And that occurs also through the cyberspace, um, how people connect through the cyberspace. They have, you know, all their, their profiles and they connect to a lease and they, sometimes they will connect on, on the ground, but often they just stay on the list. Um, so there's a compression of how they can, for example, now discuss what is happening in the north and expect what is gonna happen in the south in the next season. Because they have a lot of information and they all of them share the information online. Oh, and if they tag enough butterflies in the north, they can expect what is gonna happen with weather and other uh, discussions happening there. So I do see a lot of imagining how the new future is gonna look like for monarchs, especially based on their own experiences. And that's very interesting. And then maybe the other aspect in which time plays a role here is climate change. And I, this is new, but I have seen it around scientists discussions in the last 10 years. I don't think it was that clear. It was 10 years ago, 15, maybe 12. It was, the problem was uh, focus in Mexico and the idea that the Mexican peasants were logging the butterfly forest. That's why I, how I started my research. No one was saying anything about what was going on in the north. Then we have shifting heroes and villains narratives to Monsanto. The problem is the herbicide who's killing the weed. Now we know that it's probably, I'm not saying it's not killing the weed and of course it's killing the weed and of course it's a problem at many levels, but there's a new level of awareness of how is climate change. This butterfly needs humidity, needs temperatures that are just the ones that they need to survive. If they don't have it, they'll die. So there's new discussions around climate change and the sort of um, temporality that they, they thought it will be, they wouldn't be seeing these changes, for example and now they see it. So it's confronting them with an idea of climate change being much more present. That's what I will say. So yeah, three interesting ways in which I, I, I can frame this work as well. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question if there is another question. Jan? I mean, if someone else wants to go, no problem, but <laughs> um, yeah, recently I um, saw some a nice book passing about environmental racism and about how, you know, humans migrating and crossing national borders. Um, yeah, the role that natural environments play in being like natural barrier zones and how that is like militarized by governments and so on. Um, can you like see links between human uh, migration and the problems that the butterfly has, has migrating, different policies, etc.? Yeah, thanks for that question. So actually my larger research, um, um, I, I, something I call convergent migrations. And by traveling in this corridor, I, I didn't start <laughs> following migrants, human migrants. I started following this butterfly in migration. But it will emerge, the topic will emerge about human migration, obviously, especially me being a Mexican, I just, it, the, the topic will be there. And eventually I decided that I had to include this in a way I had to look at, at it uh, deeper. And when I talk about these convergent migrations, just quickly, because I know we're running out of time, I'm trying to connect how some things travel in this corridor, what we call North America, not only the butterfly corridor, from north to south as genetically modified corn, for example, that's NAFTA, and some things, and by that forms of travel, we have uh, affecting humans and monarchs, for example, not only for the first pesticides and herbicides that this form of monocrop needs, 
bad because it pushes people from their land in Mexico. Their corn is no longer competitive. We have data. They are migrating after NAFTA. After this, we have this form of migration from north to south of corn. So I'm trying to connect that corn migration um, from with the, the increase of human migration from south to north, and both uh, traveling through very precarious ecologies. The butterfly dying from the uh, uses of herbicides, pesticides, the lack of nectar, the climate change. Um, humans obviously suffering because we have uh, criminalization of crossing those borders. So it's interesting to say, uh, to see that the butterfly actually, I didn't mention this, but another villain is NAFTA in this story, not only related with the corn, but also they used the butterfly as a symbol of, of connecting those borders when they created the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, they use the symbol of the butterfly as saying, we, we have open borders, things will migrate. So, and they've actually created a program to protect the butterfly. So the first program to protect the butterfly was financed by, by NAFTA. That's the reason people in the reserve call it the villain. Um, so uh, it, it tells you that story of how some things in this territory we call North America are able to freely cross borders, especially woods. All of the others are protected, although they are also in reality unprotected. Butterflies are not doing better after 20 years of these conservation policies. And humans clearly are not doing better with these sort of borders. Um, and finally, just to end, uh, there's an aspect of my interest in borders that we are not only reinforcing, we don't only see that reinforcement of borders in the three across the three countries and national borders, but also in the reserve itself. The, the UNESCO program has created this sort of human free zone that is a new border inside that reserve that didn't exist. It doesn't pair with what I narrowed here of that ritualized ecology. So my critique to that UNESCO model is that it has crafted a reserve and then a, res, a, a border, pardon me, that no human land now is the one that people who want to um, cultivate avocado to ship it to the north um, are taken. So those connections are definitely there. Okay, thank you so much, Columba. That was really, really fascinating. And I also uh, thank everyone for attending. And uh, we will reconvene on the 28th of April uh, with Olivia Angers from Université Libre de Bruxelles on parasites and commensal stories of ambivalent potato companionship across Anthropocene spaces and times. And we really hope to seeing you there. And unfortunately, some people had problems to access, we learned from our administrator. So hopefully it will work uh, better next time. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you again. <laughs>